plus you have to understand how i see it is 20 year olds out there now have social media there was no instagram when this was around there wasn't even youtube there was no podcast there was no information out there a lot of the time like when i speak to different people whether it's people coming um from ethnic minorities whether it's you know females they talk about a lot of the time property development was like an old boys club like very mm -hmm. sort of white middle-aged englishmen <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of The Property by Kazi podcast. I'd like to say the favorite property podcast out there on YouTube and on the internet. Today, we are joined by another amazing guest. Chanel Ali, how are you doing? Hello. So she has promised to be very talkative. She said that she's <laughs> going to be doing all the talking, so hopefully I can sit back and relax. She has been in property for the last 17 years, has worked in the UK as well as in Dubai, has set up her own agency that's been running for 17 years, opening that at the age of 19, um, has done developments. First conversion was at the age of 24. So a lot of exciting things to talk about. So if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe and make sure you watch this video to the end. So how are we doing? I'm great. Thank you for inviting me, first of all. Always, always appreciating people <laughs> journey, you. you know, south of the river. I know you North Londoners mm. don't like coming to South London. <laughs> it's a touchy subject. Yeah, listen, man, whenever I was like, what, what areas do you cover? I'm like, anywhere but south. <laughs> listen, listen. But no, I love, I love all of London. So good. thank you. It's good. So I think starting point mm -hmm. for me is, you know, I, I kind of read your bio and obviously I know a bit about you. But for those that don't know, do you want to give them a brief overview of yourself? Yeah, it's quite a long overview. I've been doing properties since the age of two, basically. I was brought up on a building site. So my dad's in a trade. Mm -hmm. um, and I learned a lot about the building trade from a young age. Mm -hmm. And I learned about the British history of property transactions and mm -hmm. how important it was and how much property prices can grow. Mm -hmm. And from a young, I was like, wow, the way to make it in life is buy property <laughs> so what was it from an early age was it seeing like the visual transformations that got you excited or was it seeing the monetary rise like which one was it more so for you i think the visual on the the building trade was exciting for mm -hmm. me because i'm like i used to think my dad was a magician mm -hmm. i'm like wow there was nothing here yesterday and then the, this wall's growing bigger mm -hmm. and that that room's got bigger and mm -hmm. he'll be like sitting there talking about columns and mm -hmm. underpinning and i'm like learning about foundations from from a baby you know and then when I saw what them, and then in the 80s, when I saw a lot of people, when interest rates went crazy to 13%, and I saw people in trouble, and then uh, that affected like our households. Mm -hmm. I was born in Tottenham, so not from the, the richest part of town, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, then when I saw the recession here and how that affected people, I was like, okay, there's more to study here. Mm -hmm. And then I just literally just studied the property market from a young age, and I realized, yeah, but if you kept onto your properties in recession, you're retired. Yeah. Okay. So you always, always like property. And I think that's the thing for a lot of people. Like mm -hmm. they see it. And even if you're not born into it with family, friends doing it, we've all got to live somewhere. Yeah. So, and we all see like the difference of it can make, whether it's a lick of paint, whether it's some new carpets, new kitchens, yeah. new bathrooms, and it can get exciting. So, so you said you always like property. So how did you actually first get into property? So I was studying law mm -hmm. at uni. Um, Not property, by the way. No, I was just studying <laughs> law. And then my parents were like, I was like, I want to take a year out. And they're like, why? I was like, because I'm just independent. You know, I just feel like I'm not going to, I want to be the best at everything I can be. Mm -hmm. I was like, I don't know if I'm going to get a first. And I want to be a barrister. I want to be in education for like six years. I'm going to be in so much debt. Had to do the LPC. They were trying to charge me 24,000 for that. So um, I was like, let me take a year out and see what I want to do. And I walked into an estate agency in South London, mm -hmm. in Lewisham. And I was like, hi, uh, can I have your letters negotiator? And they were like, yeah, cool. You start Monday. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God. So then I just fell into lettings and mm -hmm. I absolutely loved it, you know. Mm -hmm. And literally they were like, wow, you're really good at this. Mm -hmm. And I think it just comes from... I started in retail from like the age of 12. Mm -hmm. um, my mom used to work on the market stalls. Mm -hmm. So I was with her working on the market stalls from a baby. Um, I found like I'm, I'm good with people and you are your mum and your dad. And if your mum's into sales and the fashion industry, your dad's into the building trade, you're kind of like morphed a little bit into mm -hmm. both. And then I started doing the general JD Sports, Dorothy Perkins. I worked mm -hmm. 
every retail place you can put me. Mm. So um, then I found I was really good with people. So that's when the letting side come in and it was really quick, fast yeah. lets. It was, it worked yeah. for me really well. And I think that's one thing that does kind of go unsung that, you know, a lot of experiences through different vocations, whether that be working with your parents, whether that be just learning from your parents mm. or whether that be, you know, working, you know, in retail as well mm -hmm. can actually help you and build skill sets that can make yeah. you good in terms of, you know, that first step into property yeah so you got into lettings i think um, there's nothing embarrassing about people working in mcdonald's and costa coffee mm. you know because it's actually such an amazing starting point i treat everyone that i meet from entrepreneur levels in dubai mm. to the person that's serving me a coffee exactly the same every day and i want to learn off you i want to talk to you i want to mm. make you feel like like i go into retail shops and i'm like they're like, wow, I follow you on Instagram. Like, mm. you're really good at property. And I was like, well, I was I was a retail assistant, mm. like, mm. at your age. So I think that's so important to not just be university, academically smart in life, mm -hmm. but also, obviously, like, work and hustle on the ground from a young age. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So you went into, what was the first estate agent you worked with? Acorn. Acorn. Peckham. Peckham. If you can do lettings at Peckham Rye at 18, <laughs> You're good. <laughs> yeah. Funny, I told you, I told you off mic, guys. It's like it's funny how the world works because I remember I think when I dropped out of uni, um, that I think I went into Acorn. I can't remember where it was. I think it was Creighton or. Lucian was their head office. But I went in and like I went in for this interview and they were like, yeah, you're going to come and do a trial shift and never heard back from them. <laughs> so it's funny how like these little these little steps, whether it be mm. getting good news that you got the job or getting mm. bad news can help shape like oh, where you go. And I think, blessings. you know, when things aren't going well or when they do go well, it's always good to use these experiences yeah. as like a stepping stone, like, you know, to push you forwards. Yeah. So you've gone into Acorn. Mm -hmm. You said realistically, like without blowing your own trumpet, you said you were smashing it straight away. Smashing it. And my mum was like, you need to open your own office. Mm. I was like, mum, I'm 19. Are you mad? And she was like, nope, I found you a shop in Palmer's Green. Mm. I want you to come back to North London. Um, and I was like, oh, what am I doing? I had no money blacklisted mm -hmm. uh, from my uni degree. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I was just open this. And then the building that I got, I had the lease for like 25 years mm -hmm. and it was dilapidated upstairs. So I was like, oh, I can see an opportunity here. Why don't you build flats upstairs to cover your rent for downstairs and mm -hmm. you can be there rent free. Mm -hmm. um, back then we're talking about 2008. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. So young Chanel, 19 years old, mm. sitting on Green Lanes High Street in this massive office, this whole building with a basement, like four stories, mm. to myself sitting there, what have I just done? Heart just closed down. Um, Best of Eve just closed down. When was that? 2008. 2008. So we hit recession, yeah. like big time. And I was like, oh my God, Lanes has closed down, Heart's closed down, Best of Eve's closed down, Foxen's opened and shut. And I was like, what am I doing? Mm. <laughs> And did you, for taking that first office, like how were you able to secure it? Like was, was your parents like a guarantor? Six months rent free. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I literally just blagged my way for it. Mm. Six month rent free period. And I sat there and my dad said, I'll give you a lick of paint and I'll do the electrics for you. Mm. And you're on your own. And because mm. the upstairs had two tenants, two sitting tenants mm. in it. I was basically getting rent off the sitting tenants and it was covering me on like my right move. I was working off Gumtree, mm -hmm. just calling out landlords from Gumtree. Yeah, I had nothing, literally. <laughs> so obviously you kind of, and I don't know, would you recommend that in hindsight, if you were speaking yeah. to somebody and you were looking after them and they said, look, I want an open estate agency. Mm. Based off your experience, like mm -hmm. what would you recommend? Like how many, how much experience would you say somebody needs before going mm -hmm. it alone? Things have changed massively, yeah? Mm -hmm. The legislation and due diligence has gone in crazy. To do one, let you need two two members of staff now. Mm -hmm. Then there was no need to even protect deposits. So the way that the country's come, plus we used to uh, gain massively off agent uh, tenants fees. Now we don't even get that. Mm -hmm. So we're doing so much work for a lot less money. Plus, you have to understand how I see it is 20-year-olds out there now have social media, there was no Instagram when mm -hmm. this was around. There wasn't even YouTube. There was no podcast. There was no information out there. Mm -hmm. So I've just come up from that generation where my parents were like hard work, open up businesses and see how it goes. There was no there was no business plan, you know, nothing like that. Um, and it has worked, obviously. Mm -hmm. But with the knowledge and experience that people have now, you can go massive, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm grateful 
that I did, I was just fearless. I think that was, yeah. that was one word for me as 19. But now 19, you need 150,000 to start up mm. any business, really. So, I mean, like, so where then, if obviously like a lot of people don't have, like, let alone 150,000, mm -hmm. don't have 15,000, mm -hmm. where would you say, would you say going to get a job in, for someone that's like, look, I want to get into property. Yeah. Would you say it's a good idea to maybe get a job, whether it's in lettings or sales, to kind of learn the ropes? If you're good at sales, mm -hmm. property is the best thing for you. Mm -hmm. Like, it is definitely the most amazing starting point in life um, because it's guaranteed. We know that the property market is amazing in England. It's the mm. best market in the world. I've studied the whole of the world's property market. And there's, in my eyes, no better, safer place than London mm -hmm. to invest. Plus the longevity of it. Like you can be in this career for life and you know it's going to pay. It's consistent. It's not like when people, Bitcoin and other stuff that people trading that people are getting into and you're in and out and it's there's no history to see it. Mm. Property is absolutely amazing. You know, you've got stages it. Even as a lettings neg, you can be doing twenty lets a month. Mm -hmm. If on a bit in a, for a big firm and in the smaller firms, you'd be doing about five lets a month. You know, but then five lets are amazing. Um, I highly recommend anyone getting a, getting a job in in property and starting from the bottom and working your way up. So you mentioned obviously about like being able to speak to people and building relationships. Mm -hmm. You obviously had a lot of confidence. Are there any other skills that you think would make somebody a good negotiator? Well, I've got I've got skills that are not great. I'm way too honest. <laughs> They're like, oh my god, you stayed as your liars. I'm like, I'm definitely not. Like, I I I'm so honest, mm -hmm. and I just like to help people. And I think that's where I was was I succeeded to be mm -hmm. honest because people trusted me. And I've had the same clients for 16, 17 years and their portfolios are growing, mm -hmm. you know, but um, skill wise, I just be, be authentic, be yourself. And you know what? It's not for everyone. And if it's not for you, you need to need to walk away and, and find something that's for you. It's not worth killing yourself in an industry that you don't love and you don't like. Mm -hmm. You have to love everything you do in life, not just work. Okay. So with your agency, obviously you set it up, you said at the beginning, it was a case of, you know, you got it, had a six month rent free period. Mm -hmm. I think obviously to start with, when you were working for somebody else, realistically, you had the instructions and you just had to go out there and, you know, let the properties. But obviously yeah. when you set up your own estate agency, yeah. you've now got to go out there and get the clients. With no social media. So how, <laughs> how were you getting the instructions? Gumtree, mm -hmm. uh, knocking on doors every day going down the high street, giving people boxes of chocolates, mm -hmm. doing it off opening, launch, uh, like inviting all the local estate agents, all the local developers. I've just basically out there, you know, mm -hmm. present and work rate. Yeah. I think that is one thing that, you know, I think there's, there's so many good things to say about like the kind of Gen Z's, I know there's a new gen something else, but like in terms of people's hustle, but sometimes I think, people do shy away from the hard work because mm -hmm. there's a lot of opportunities out there to make fast money. Mm -hmm. But I think <laughs> if, if you want longevity in something, you've got to be able to put in the hard graph. And I yeah. think that's a common denominator that I see when speaking to people yeah. that have been successful in business for a long period of time, that they're not afraid of the hard work. They don't, they don't just want it easy. No. I think I thrive on challenging times mm -hmm. and hard work. So like for me, if it's too easy, I'm like, right, I need to think of 10 things to do. It's, it's probably not a great trait, but I'm like, no, I want to build. I would like a big reason like step into Dubai, mm -hmm. massive challenge, mm -hmm. you know? I'm like, but I've done enough in London now. I feel like my skills can go global and mm -hmm. I can help people globally and not just in London. Okay, so in the UK, so mm -hmm. you've set up now, you've, mm -hmm. you've started to obviously get your clients, yep. you've started to see proof of concept. Mm -hmm. Do you remember who your first landlord was who gave you an instruction? Yeah, my first landlord, he, uh, he, there was a few, I've still mm -hmm. got their managements, mm -hmm. believe it or not, 16 years on. So I started with nothing and I, I slowly, I had to build on lettings because sales was not happening. Mm -hmm. There was no mortgages. They stopped giving. I don't know if you remember mortgages to new builds. Mm -hmm. So developers were in a really bad place. So I was like trying to find all these holes to help my landlords get money. So I was like, right, go to the council, get contracts with the council, guaranteed rent, mm -hmm. um, HMO schemes, care home schemes. I started doing that 60, 16 years ago for my clients. So... Um, there was that was basically a big part of the business definitely mm -hmm. and my first landlord yeah passed, a lot of my landlords passed away in covid mm -hmm. which is really really that's really sad. sad that's sad and i guess 
another thing I think is obviously I always think about the challenges as well because you've mm. already mentioned number one you were still a teenager mm -hmm. number two it was in you know a massive recession yeah and number three obviously being a female in the mm -hmm. industry as well and a young female how did you find that did you ever find that as a barrier so a lot of people ask me that now <sighs> they never used to ask me that before now as I'm again like into a woman from a young girl I see I didn't again completely fearless and I didn't think about mm. it so I was just just do, going and thinking my mindset has always just been to never depend on anyone in mm. life and to do everything for yourself not look around you what people were doing left and right whether they're male or female so now I'm like wait a minute but I am a woman like you're going on like you're you know that there there is a there is a difference between men and women. Mm. Um, but I think it's helped me, if I'm honest. It's helped you, yeah, yeah, I think it has because people, I feel, tr can trust you a little bit more mm. and they they take me seriously because of the experience, I, I That's feel. interesting. So a lot of the time, like when I speak to different people, whether mm -hmm. it's people coming um, from ethnic minorities, whether it's, you know, females, they talk about a lot of the time property development was like an old boys club, like very mm -hmm. sort of white, middle-aged Englishmen and it was different. But I guess you said maybe on your side, because you were different, you didn't use that difference as a reason that people wouldn't trust you, but use it as a reason that I've actually I've got something more for you. Like, yeah, I don't look at I don't look at that being a difference. Mm. I, I, so I or on or, or an advantage. Mm. I just focus on you know I'm what I, on me at the end of the day and doing the business and and performing the best I can and working the best I can and mm -hmm. that's always benefited me. Don't get me wrong. I'm sure people look at me and like, oh, she ain't gonna perform. But when I perform, they're like, wow, you actually performed in the time mm -hmm. scale. You said you're gonna perform. You sound here. very positive. Like, have you always been this positive? Too positive. <laughs> I think I'm too positive. I just love everything, you mm -hmm. know. And and that's I, what I mean. Like yeah. that statement, I just love everything, is a very positive because, statement. And if there's ever a challenge or a a resistance to something, it it, it ain't gonna happen. It ain't mm -hmm. gonna work. So you have to try and pull back but that. there must have like is there not a time then that you felt like you felt overwhelmed or you felt like that your positivity has been tested mm. and how did you overcome it you can't <laughs> you can't you can't be tested you have to be so strong mm. i really feel like you do like don't get me wrong i've had surveyors undervalue me my own projects mm. i've had deals fall through if i tell you how much money of deals i've fallen mm. through on a yearly basis you'll be like mm. But that's not the reality. You mm. can't count your money and your deals before you get them. Mm. You have to just focus on the reality of today. That's good. That's for me one. personally, like I'm a very positive person mm -hmm. and I think I'm very positive, but I do think sometimes I almost suffer from burnout to a point I've forced myself to be positive for so long mm. that at certain points it does get a little bit overwhelming. But it's good to hear that you're just able to push through and long may that continue. Take time out. I've got mm. such a balanced lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I'll disappear for a few days, come back stronger than ever. Time on your own is so important. Mm -hmm. Meditating, closing them thoughts. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, yeah. so you think like to find that balance, you definitely make sure you have that work-life balance, spend yeah. time by yourself. I think that's good advice for a lot of people because, you know, I think particularly as like the world has moved so quickly over the last 30 years with social media, like, mm. um, you know, sort of 30 years ago, like, you know, 10, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, pre-Facebook, pre-Instagram, pre everything, you had no idea what your friends from 20 years ago were doing. Yeah. Now you know what everybody had for dinner, what they're eating yesterday, yeah. who they're arguing with. Yeah. And I think it's a lot to take on board. And we spend so much time being like yeah, so glued to our phones <laughs> so just if you can detract and spend yeah. some time by yourself and be comfortable yeah, by yourself. just just try not to let everything else you know it's, it's hard it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's hard for other people but you, when you realize that it's life is all about you mm -hmm. okay and it's a mirror and it's like what you see in front of you is what you're going to get back mm -hmm. so you can't pay attention to everything else around you and just focus on your everyday that's nice that's interesting i think that's a good hot take there so off the back of life being about you, mm -hmm. to get to the point where life can be about you, in your business, you had to start employing people and trusting other people so you yeah. could take that time. How did you find that process of, because you sound like somebody who's very like, I want to do everything. How did you find oh, no, being it. able to be, okay, like I've actually got a manager and got somebody else. You have else to trust. You have to trust. In, mm -hmm. If you don't trust your staff or your network or your mm -hmm. family or your friends, 
There's no point mm. in, in anything and you're going to be a very lonely person. Today's episode is brought to you by Run Production Studios. They're where we've been recording for the last 15 episodes and I definitely recommend you check them out. If you want to take your content to the next level, whether that's videography or podcasts, they're the people to check out with high quality customer service and amazing equipment. Their details will be in the description of this video. You have to trust yourself to be able to trust every, everyone else. I would not be where I am without my family, my friends and my colleagues. And I call them my colleagues. I go and sit with my, my team, they're mm -hmm. my team. I sit next to them all day. Mm -hmm. I'm not in a separate office at the back, giving orders, shouting down. I'm there with them mm -hmm. through everything. And without them, I wouldn't be here today. And you can't grow on your own. Mm -hmm. You need a big team. And the bigger you grow, the bigger the team has to get. And as soon as you see the challenges with staff and they're not performing, you need to sit down and be like, right, what, where are the, you know, where, where is everything? Yeah. So uh, where are you at with things? And, and that's it. Okay. And then do you think you've changed now in terms of your management process? Or do you think it's been very similar from when you started to now? Mm, a little bit. Mm. I try not to get too, too close to, to my team as I used to be. Mm. I used to be out with them every weekend, Okay. you know, so now it's like, we'll just do a, an event, like maybe once every few months mm -hmm. and when you have a bad seed in the office or in your team, it can kill 25% of your business. Mm -hmm. And that's massive. And it's happened to me quite so, a lot. Because you sound very positive. <laughs> you know, wh when you identify that maybe somebody's not great in terms of creating a cohesive environment, mm -hmm. are you able to kind of cut it out. cut out quite quickly? Or did you have to learn that over time? I, I definitely learned that over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm very forgiving and kind and mm -hmm. honest person. So in all my relationships, it's ta it, ta that's, it takes me time. So the fact that I'm aware of that now is amazing. And the fact that people can learn that now from a young age is even better. Mm -hmm. So you definitely say you recommend it. Like go with your gut. If you think somebody's not right for the business, then you take them you've got out. to put the business first. Oh yeah, of course. Because... That business is your, it's on your head, mm -hmm. you know, so everything that goes wrong in that, within that company is going to be blamed on you. Mm -hmm. Um, They can go next door, go two miles down the road and get another job. You mm -hmm. can't. Yeah. So you need to make sure that you're, you are number one within your company. And then as long as you're thriving, successful, happy, then everyone else is going to be. Okay, nice. So then, so we've got to a point where you've got your agency, you're set up, you've built a team, you've built, you know, your relationships, you're becoming more established. And then you wanted to pivot, obviously, you're seeing your dad do it, you're seeing mm -hmm. your clients do it. So you pivoted into developments. What was mm -hmm. your first development like? So I had the two flats on top of my shop. I did a very naughty development. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a plan now, <laughs> as I can say it. But I made five studio flats mm -hmm. out of two flats mm -hmm. um, as a permitted development. But mm -hmm. I did it however I did it. I did it with all my money saved up, um, my little pennies and pounds. Mm -hmm. um, back then, it was 40% less than it was now. And they were bringing a fantastic income. And mm -hmm. I learned how to split meters and, you know, get a page. You go with electric. I took a lot of gas out of, of mm -hmm. them because I knew I weren't going to be able to get meters in for the five studios because mm -hmm. they weren't legal. So, yeah, that was my first. I was 24. Okay. So, mm -hmm. effectively, you did that. Probably didn't do it right at the time, but you since legalized it with established use. Yeah. Yeah. And you've got that now. And is yeah. that, so they, they classed as separate entities or yeah. is it still? Completely a... self-contained five studio flats. Nice. Yeah. Okay. And I think obviously, like, we don't, you know, we'd advocate doing things the right way. But obviously, <laughs> if you do do things the wrong way, mm -hmm. then it's important to as quickly as possible. You can't you know. do that anymore, guys, just to let you know. Yeah. This was 12 years ago. Um, yeah. Definitely not. You have to get planning permission. Different time. Yeah, uh, different time. Before, you could just call up yeah. and let you know. But now, unless you're on Royal Mail, you're not getting your MPAN number, which yeah. means you can't get You don't meter. want tenants like that anyway. Mm -hmm. So just definitely, definitely not. But that was my first development. <laughs> so that was yeah. your first one. But obviously, I'm sure you learned a lot, like in yeah. terms of actually dealing with the builders, the contractors. Yeah. Was it like a main building contract? Or my did dad. You... So your dad, okay <laughs> yeah. then. He helped me with, with all the contracting mm -hmm. side of things. My brother's an electrician. Mm -hmm. He does all of our electrics. As you know, electrics are massive with mm -hmm. developments. Um, I've got a maintenance agency of three, 400 managements. Mm -hmm. So um, I have all the team downstairs in the office mm -hmm. all the time. It, it, it went quite smoothly, okay. yeah, that one. And then the second one, I found some land for my dad in Tottenham. Mm -hmm. And um, it had planning for two houses on it, and attached to it was another house. And um, we split. I split that into 
legal for HMOs, self-contained mm-hmm. dwellings. And it was right by Tottenham Stadium. That was about eight years ago. Mm-hmm. And that's when Tottenham, the new stadium was being built. So that was a really good one. To, okay, to and get. you retain that? Yeah, yeah. You yeah. retain that. Retain so that it's four HMOs. How many units in each of the HMOs? Four. So I've got four in, oh, and five in, in Farmer's Green. Okay. So okay. five studios. So they like studios. Okay. They're basically like studio flats, yeah. Okay, nice, yeah. nice, nice. No, they do really well. I think the thing is as mm. well is one of the reasons they do so well at the moment, like I've got a few bed sitch slash studio um, yeah. projects or like or properties that I retain this because the reality is that the one bed market for a lot of people that are kind of, you know, new newer mm. into working and not necessarily as affordable but they don't mm. want to share so those self-contained yeah. units work really well as like a stepping stone yeah they are amazing income but mm-hmm. they're still if you have one empty and it can affect you quite a bit mm-hmm. so what with hmos now what i like to do is give it offer it out to a care home and the mm. care home will take all the hmos even children's care home they take bigger hmos like 10 properties mm. and then um 10 rooms sorry and then you're not getting any empty periods mm-hmm. and they pay the bills. The problem we've got now is, is utilities. Mm-hmm. So HMOs, I'm, I am shying away from in studio flats, to be mm-hmm. honest with you, because you can't get the meters mm-hmm. done for water and council tax and there's more liabilities there. Yeah. So There are some ways now, there's some new things that have come up, for example, like even when you've got a separate, so say you've got a single... Yeah single meter yeah you have one meter okay. but you have like these sub meters that they're not so they but so you you're still the meter but then you can like sub yeah and they pay the you and it goes into your bank yeah. account right no they're really good yeah no, I've, I've, hey listen hmo studios are amazing amazing bread mm-hmm. bread and butter mm-hmm. definitely okay because i think they increase your yield to about 14 mm-hmm. percent and then what other projects have you done i know you said you're sort of trying now you want to do like yeah. one a year is your focus now I want to do one here and one in Dubai every mm. year. That's my focus. Um, in lockdown, so basically, I have I'm very positive as you know. So I had a vision board, mm-hmm. and my vision board, my first properties that I fell in love with as a kid was in Primrose Hill. You know the coloured houses mm-hmm. opposite Regent's Park. Yeah. So I was like, I'm going to live here one day. And then lockdown came, and I was like, getting a bit challenged. Uh, I think with the deaths and everything going on, it was it was a it was sad times for everyone. And I was like, right, I want to live in Primrose Hill. And then I basically was like checking my bank now. And I'm like, well, I've just done that project. My money's tied there because I'm retaining everything. So I was, I, mm-hmm. I bought a few period conversions, um, a few new build flats that I lived in, like luxury flats. Mm-hmm. So I was like, my money is all in property and it's recession. Everything's in the air. Like, what am I going to do? I can't afford to live in Primrose Hill. It's, it's quite an exclusive area. And I was like someone said to me why don't you rent and i was like i can't rent you know mm. I'm, I'm a property developer and i'm into property and i'm gonna and then i was like and then i thought about it and i was like no like so many successful people rent and you don't yeah. even realize it like so what if that's going to enable you to to move move mm-hmm. up steps so i rented and then in covid my business grew 25 percent because unfortunately of everything that was going on we were i was valuing homes all day long and mm. there was a lot of you know, distressed deals and people that had to sell for um, free probates and stuff. Mm-hmm. So the business was growing and I moved into this rental accommodation literally in the middle of Primrose Hill. And um, I said to the building manager, I was like, is, if there's any little flats around here, especially in this block, I would mm-hmm. love to take it. And he goes, oh, the upstairs, he said, it's um, it's been dilapidated. No one's t- stepped foot in there for 30 years. Mm-hmm. And I was like, perfect <laughs> and he was like you sure it's i'm so embarrassed to take you and i was like no no i'd love it so i went and i went and bridged it mm. um and because i lived downstairs i bridged that and i uh he gave me six months again to do it up mm-hmm. which I was, I was very lucky with so that was and i did it beautiful like brushed gold yeah amazing dropped the very, ceilings very, paneling very dubai-esque yes <laughs> exactly i think look like you have to be you have to work in the market Mm. work based on the current market conditions Mm -hmm. so you know now that it's more of a buyer's market you can be a little bit more creative so Mm. whether that means you know like you've mentioned delayed completions Mm. um you know being able to buy and actually flip without even actually purchasing the property there are options and interest was low then yeah so that's why i I was happy to go on a bridge whereas now uh Mm. yeah touchy subjects (laughs) <laughs> yeah, bridging is expensive, but again, it's all about, and I, I do say this to a lot of people, the mm. reality is it's all about how you make the deal work for you. So, mm. for example, if your bridging two years ago was going to cost you 
for argument's sake, for a year, let's say, forty thousand pounds, mm. and now it's going to cost you sixty thousand. Mm. You just know that means if you offer twenty thousand pounds less, thirty thousand pounds less, you're still in the same position. Yeah. So yeah. it's just it's still that bit hard when you're paying like monthlies, mm. and then obviously the problem you've got is delays with with builders. Yeah, then you're paying even more forfeits, and also I'm I'm not being a depressing mm. development. Mm. You see me being positive. I'm just yeah. be, I'm being real. Uh, properties are not selling. Uh, yeah. as quick as they were so that that's so they need to factor in that plan yeah B. no definitely so that's yeah. why i always say like you know making sure that you do have that contingency but whether mm. it's budget and also time so particularly also if you know that you're going to be a little bit financially stretched mm. then actually you know paying retained interest so rather than yeah. having to service a loan having the retained interest for your bridging loan which means you pay it up front so it means you need more money up front yeah. But realistically, if you don't have the money, maybe you shouldn't do the deal. And it stops people from overstretching. So now you're of that mindset. But whereas development, developers didn't know that two years ago, mm. right? So they've gone into this site. 12, I've, I've, I've seen developers in bad ways at the moment. Mm. They've got 20, 30, 50 units. Some have got 100 units. And they didn't have that mindset. They're not going to sell. Mm. Or the, the, the lenders are going to have to go for a stress test. What was a stress test two years ago? Mm -hmm. You know, so now where things have gone everything has changed that we didn't interpret two years ago. Um, so now it's about changing mm -hmm. your sites and strategies. Yeah, you've got to be more dynamic, I think. you know. Again, like I mentioned, you have to base it on current market conditions. So mm -hmm. you have to maybe play a little bit safer. Whereas before yeah. you were budgeting, okay, well, worst case, I'll yeah. refinance at 75%. Yeah. Now you've got to look at what does it look like at 65%? What does it look at 60, 50%? And yeah. does the deal still work? Yeah. So I think stress testing is really important. Yeah. Um, so you've spoken a lot about England and the market and how things are now. Mm -hmm. But obviously markets are different in different countries. Mm -hmm. um, in Dubai at the moment, mm -hmm. uh, the market's very buoyant still and mm. you've kind of diversified. Mm -hmm. But why did you feel the need to go to another country when your agency was going well here? Like what made you travel to Dubai? Ah, oh, tax. <laughs> so when I did my last development, um, the Primrose Hill one, and I was like, I, d I couldn't find another site mm -hmm. in time and I got this heavy tax bill because I sold it. My first development mm -hmm. that I sold and I didn't keep. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what is this about kind of thing? <laughs> so I was like, do you know what? The market's really moving in Dubai. And mm -hmm. how I've learned with properties, I've just done everything for myself. I've done my own HMOs. That's how I help mm -hmm. clients because I've, I've done it. Mm -hmm. That's, so I was like, go and buy a property in Dubai. Um, I went to the biggest developer called Imar mm -hmm. and I went and... I invested in an area called Dubai Creek, which mm -hmm. is just being launched now. And they said it's going to be the new the new downtown in 10 years. And when we got paid, and, and then basically when I found my own property, they were like, I will pay you as a broker. And mm -hmm. when I got paid and it was like five times the amount of what you're getting in London mm -hmm. for no tax, I was like, oh my gosh, one sale a month is is a whole month of, of working in, in England, yeah. you know? And I was like, and it's tax free. And I was like, okay. Now I see what's happening, but there is, it's not easy. So how long, how long have you been operating as like a, it's like a broker effectively? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like a, re re like a referee. So mm. I've seen a gap in the market in England. I saw people getting stressed out with the market here and a lot of people wanted to move their funds and not pay tax. So I found another gap mm -hmm. and I, I'm basically all of my clients here that want to buy in Dubai, mm -hmm. I'm their go-to. Mm -hmm. I do like consultations for them. Mm -hmm. uh, with my team in Dubai on the ground and I study every single launch every night when I finish here in mm -hmm. London I'll go home and I'll study the next launch that's launching tomorrow and then I'll be like right this launch is this is launching tomorrow this is an estimated return mm -hmm. we've got four years payment plan this is how mortgages work I help people with visas bank accounts everything yeah, yeah. No problem. Well, make sure that we put the link uh, for you in the description <laughs> below you. if people are interested in potentially looking to purchase in Dubai. What would you say? Obviously, there are a lot of the positives. Would you say there's any pitfalls for investing in Dubai at the moment? The market, it, there's no history. <laughs> there's no history. And the legislation is not a lot either. No conveyancing. Mm. And I was like, so who does this legal work here on the south? They're like, oh, you do it all. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, this is different. You can buy a property in one day. Mm -hmm. You can sell a property in one day. You can pull out of a bag of cash. And uh, just buy a not as much anymore. No, no, no. That's all coming to an end. Mm, I, I hope so. <laughs> you see it still, like, particularly, okay. like, maybe I'm more talking about in lettings, but people just go and pay, like, just go oh, and pay for a year. you pay you up front. Yeah. You have to pay you up front out there and they'll yeah. take it cash. But as in, yeah, obviously, there's a lot of sanctioned money going through Dubai in the last yeah. two years. Um, 
I think the UAA have to pull back on that mm-hmm. um, because there's real people with real money that have worked from nothing mm-hmm. that want to bring their money over to Dubai and we're competing with sanctioned money and you're mm-hmm. never going to, like I want to do a development there. I know that's going to be so hard because mm-hmm. you're competing with the, you know, the UAE basically. Yeah. No competition. No yeah. massive. So what, what's next for you then? You're saying you want to do a development in Dubai. What type mm-hmm. of project do you want to do? I just want to start off with maybe one unit. Mm-hmm. Um, my, Main thing is to just keep, so like with the developers now, I'm trying to find them a plan B mm-hmm. in London. Mm-hmm. So I'm starting to do a lot of Airbnbs, the short term rentals for them. Mm-hmm. Cause when they're coming to me, they're like, Chanel, we're, we're completing in four weeks. I'm like, right, if I'm not gonna be able to sell them, I need to find a, a plan B for mm-hmm. my clients because I know how stressed they are mm-hmm. and I don't want my clients to go through that. Um, so that's what I do now. That's why I'm here, to be honest, because I, the market's changed so much. People, my clients need me here. So I'm here now, just mm-hmm. focusing on getting these developments for clients like closed and mm-hmm. then hopefully sourcing them new sites and then doing a little bit of my own stuff in Dubai. And in the meantime, if people want to buy in Dubai, I'm, I'm there as well. Okay, so you got you acting effectively <laughs> like as a broker slash buying agent in Dubai, yeah. making sure that you help to maximize people's investment opportunities mm-hmm. in the UK. Also, look after those that maybe have been affected by the market, whether yeah. that be changing interest rates yeah. that mean that their prices are going up. So maybe typical buy to let model isn't working, yeah. and the Airbnb model you're helping with yeah. that. So effectively, I think a lot of what you've done, um, you know, and a lot of why you've been successful. Mm-hmm is solving problems. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's what a lot of people shy away from. They'll look mm. at a market and say there's a recession. Oh, it means I can't do anything. Mm. But actually a recession, you know, means that there's gonna be opportunities. Whenever mm-hmm. there's threats to a market, there's always gonna be opportunities. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where you've thrived. Yeah. Um, if people wanna reach out to you, wanna connect with you yeah. for any of the things that you've mentioned, let them know, how can they find you? Yeah, you can find me on Instagram, uh, Chanel Ali X1. And mm. I think my main thing is even though there is opportunities for developers and people like us who've been in the industry for 17 years, it's still a hard time for other people. Mm-hmm. So what I try to do is is be there for, for people. You know, contact me on Instagram, I'll message you back straight away. Mm-hmm. If any sort of help that I can offer you at all, I'll offer you a consultation mm-hmm. and then um, a Zoom meeting and then we can, I'm here to help. Because of my experience, I feel like that's what I love to do the most. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the meantime, you don't know. I feel like in life, your character um, is is what helps you, you know. And if, if you're that person, they'll they'll be like, wow, you know, like all my tenants. I I used to go back in the day, like seventeen years. I used to sit on the floor and eat with them. They mm-hmm. couldn't afford a dinner table, so go into their houses. They were refugees from mm-hmm. the war. I used to go and sit with them on the floor and eat like once a month, and mm-hmm. you know, and and then people now they're driving Mercedes. They've got their mortgages. Mm-hmm. So they're, they're the people that you you need to be on both sides, uh, on everyone. We're all one, you know. That's good. Very, like I said, still remaining <laughs> very positive. Final two questions. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned you got your kind of, quote unquote, in terms of living in your dream area in Primrose Hill. Mm. You're looking at, you obviously got a place in Dubai. Mm. But what's like in terms of goals, dreams, what else have you got that you haven't achieved that you want to achieve over the next five to 10 years? <sighs> Um, I've I've now got to an age where I'm like, right, this is where I want to be financially. Mm-hmm. I never looked at that. I just winged everything through life, and I was like, yeah, just buy that. I'll just develop that, save some money, buy that, save more money, mm-hmm. buy that. Now I'm like, right, this is where I want to be. At, I think 30 was a big turning point for me. Mm-hmm. Where I started writing down my goals, and then they started manifesting. And I was like, okay, wow, like this planning stuff really works. You know, being disciplined really, really mm-hmm. works. Meditating works. Um, listen to people's advice. You don't understand how powerful it is. You think, oh, that we're not being big headed or, you know, we just actually want to help you develop things. And that's, by me helping people is helping myself. That's how I look at it. Um, I just want to grow, obviously, to a financial stage where I can mainly just focus on probably my own projects and helping people. Mm-hmm. Um, I did a lot of charity work. So I spent two years in COVID feeding the homeless um every night just because i felt like i needed to Mm -hmm. and i'll probably want to go back into doing some more charity work like with children it's like one of my goals and obviously i really want a family of my own Mm -hmm. that's like a massive goal for me it's amazing man well we wish you all the best (laughs) um final question Mm -hmm. we ask everybody and it's one of the common questions that i get asked i always try and pass the buck and get someone to help me for somebody who's saying you know i'm 
17 18 19 or even older but it's like i have i have got no experience in property yeah. maybe don't have you know savings built up yeah. what would you where would you advise them to start or what primark. advice would you have for them go to primark and just save your money and invest mm. it in anything you can anywhere you can i see so many amazing developers now mm. offering projects in like nottingham mm. and liverpool and up north anywhere you can go and invest invest in england because mm. You've got such a long history and I think that is so important and just do it on your own and don't depend on anyone because you can't let yourself down. Okay. That's it. Well, this is probably one of the most positive episodes we've had. Um, I'm Kaz. Um, this has been another episode of The Property by Kazzy Podcast. If you haven't already, make sure you like this video, make sure you subscribe. We're going to have another amazing guest each and every week. We appreciate you being here with us and catch you next week. 